Testing. Okay. Looks like we have sound. So let's get started. So I, as promised, I have some thoughts on chapter five, but this time I'm going to try something a little different. My good lady wife suggested that perhaps I should use more visuals in my presentations to make it more engaging. Ah, worth a shot. So let's give it a go. So let me go to my share screen and share my thoughts about uh, chapter five of the textbook. So this chapter deals with the tension between absolutism and relativism in ethics, the major arguments for and against each of these positions. Here's a few points I'd like to share. First, is this a matter of absolute, is it really a matter of absolutism versus relativism or does the principle of non-contradiction non attach to this issue? Is this perhaps instead a false dichotomy? Could it be that this is both a, a both and situation versus an either or situation? Instead of weighing in on one versus the other, should we perhaps consider the context in which one is given priority over the other and if or whether there is a balance to be struck between the two positions? For example, in the game of chess, consider this statement, quote, if your knight is threatened, you ought to prefer to move to a position where you can put two or more of your opponent's pieces in a knight's fork rather than move, to, move it to a position where you can't make such an attack. Now, if you're not familiar with the game of chess, that statement without the context of that familiarity is meaningless. But if you are familiar with chess, that statement should be obvious. Either way, it is technically, that statement is technically a moral or a value proposition since it is prescribing an optimal action. But as such, it is contextual since it is contingent upon the goals, rules, and process of the game's game of chess. Well, let me try to make an analogy with ethics in society. Let me suggest an analogy that might help with resolving the tension between absolutism and relativism. Could it be that the enduring appeal of games like chess and sports like baseball and football? Could it be that the reason why they continue to appeal to people is because they are a symbolic microcosm of the attention of humankind engaging with each other in the context of society? As with such games and sports, there are rules uh, in society, there are laws and social norms there are commonly shared or consistent goals, winning at chess, football, baseball, or indeed in life. None of these rules apply or attach unless there is some interconnection between two or more people within the context of the rules of the given endeavor. If we apply game theory to human society, doesn't this suggest a way to resolve the tension between absolutism and relativism? Specifically, I'm put in mind of a common distinction in criminal law between what we call malum prohibitum, bad because it's prohibited, versus malum in se. Bad because prohibited are things that are bad because they go against the rules of a given society. For example, in the US, if you drive on the left side of the road, you're doing something wrong, morally wrong, because it's prohibited and driving on the right side of the road is prescribed by the law of the land. But obviously in Great Britain, the prohibitions and prescriptions in this case are reversed. Then there is what we consider things that are bad in itself. Actions that are considered bad in themselves are things such as, oh, I don't know, murder and theft or perjury or fraud. Now these are considered bad because they're considered wrong in every society. They do seem to be universal. 
perhaps because without those prohibitions, an organized society would be impossible to maintain. Now, perhaps I should have mentioned this before, but if I'm going to have to use so many visuals, you are warned, a dad joke is forthcoming. So let me just float out the po this possibility. Given that the tension between absolutism and relativism only attaches in the context of a social order, could relativism be appropriate for matters that are relevant in the context of a particular society, driving on the right side versus the left side of a road, for example, and absolutism only attaches to those pro prohibitions or prescriptions that seem to be universally agreed to. Prohibitions against murder, theft, lying, and sexual impropriety, for example. When such prohibitions and prescriptions are necessary for the continuation of society. Think about it. Could you really have a functional society if people had to be at fear for their lives or fear for having their goods, their property stolen if they could not count on the word of other people or if there was constant threat to people's um, intimate relationships? So, Here's my question for you all, assuming that you've already read this chapter. What do you think? Is there a way to resolve the tension between absolutism and relativism? I've floated my observations about it, but let me say something that most professors don't, but this is a class in philosophy. I might be wrong. Maybe you have a better thought. Absolutism and relativism both have merits. They both um, have arguments that can be made for them, but they also have arguments that can be made against them. Is there a way to resolve the tension between moral or ethical absolutism and ethical or moral relativism? Let me, know your, your, let me know your thoughts. Those are my thoughts on chapter five. Ciao.